afternoon. So good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to all of you, wherever you may be. Uh, I am Susan Needham, Professor of Anthropology at California State University, Dominguez Hills in Carson, California, which is in Los Angeles County. It's my pleasure to moderate today's session. It's actually quite an honor, um, which is sponsored by the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. Today, we're going to talk about the intersections of popular and orthodox religious practices in mainland Southeast Asia, specifically the identification and designation of Chinese temples in Thailand, the reemergence and transformation of mediumship in urban Phnom Penh, Cambodia, and the ethnic and religious identities of the Chambani in central Vietnam. I'm really excited about our panel today. Each panelist will have 15 minutes to present their research, which will be followed by discussion questions for them from me. Um, we will have time at the end for questions that you all may have. So please put your questions in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, and we will address as many as we can at the end of the session. Before I introduce our panelists, I'd like to give you a little background on my own research and how this session developed. My ethnographic research focuses primarily on Cambodian Americans in Long Beach, California, but I have also spent time in Cambodia doing comparative research as well. When I began learning about Cambodian culture, the very first thing um, Cambodians told me I was that I had to learn about Buddhism because, quote, to be Cambodian is to be Buddhist. This phrase is also quoted in practically every scholarly publication on Cambodian Americans at that time. So I dutifully read everything I could find on Buddhism and its practice in Southeast Asia. Everything I read began by explaining that the practice is not pure. It's a synthesis of pre-existing animism, Hinduism, and Buddhism. From there, scholars moved on to focus on the way Southeast Asian Buddhism aligns or diverges from the orthodox form. They provided little to no details on animistic or Hindu aspects or their intersection with Buddhist practice. That wasn't necessarily a problem, though, because initially my research was focused on socialization practices and the significance of Khmer language and literacy in Long Beach. So I wasn't looking at religion per se. So also, I was unaware of how limited and in many ways inaccurate the information was. But as I learned more about Cambodian culture, I began to notice altars that different kinds of people had which may have a Buddha image on them, but were dedicated to various other important non-human entities. On one of my trips to Cambodia, I was taken to a medium in a village located on the south side of Angkor Wat. She had a large altar that dominated the single room. I didn't know what it was. I'd never seen one before. My guide didn't speak English and my Khmer wasn't I was good enough to ask what it was, but I really didn't understand the answer. And nothing seemed to happen. I didn't know I was supposed to be there to ask for guidance from the, the woman who was there. Um, there were images of the Buddha on the altar, along with flowers, candles, incense, and various statues and artifacts that I didn't recognize at the time. And because of the Buddha, I guessed it was a Buddhist altar. I just had never seen anything like it before. On that same trip, I went to a demonstration of Khmer martial arts known as Bokatao. The Bokatao master told those in attendance that there were no living masters left after the Khmer Rouge, they'd all been killed, but he had brought the art back to life. So after the demonstration, I asked him, I was curious if there's no living masters, how was he able to recreate the art? How did, did he know it previously? And he motioned to a large red altar in the corner of the room and said his guardian spirit had taught him, the spirit of Bokapau. 
Back in Long Beach, I was invited to attend a Sampea Cruz ceremony, which is done to honor former teachers and guardian spirits of the Cambodian court dance. The elders built a large altar upon which they placed dance equipment, musical instruments, uh, and um, the images of the guardians of the dance and past teachers. There was no Buddha image there. Then while doing research in Long Beach for a Cambodian culture festival, I met Mr. Kiem, whose mother had been a healer in Prasat province, Cambodia, prior to the Khmer Rouge. It was through Mr. Kiem that I began to learn about Krum Sasana, which translates to Brahman religion, and the non-Buddhist Hindu altars known as asana, that the crew have as part, or crew are teachers, that they have as part of their practice. And these are the altars that I've been seeing that I just described, the asana. In pre-1975 Cambodia, these altars were associated with specific occupations, such as healers, court dancers, musicians, wrestlers, midwives, elephant trainers, and military, to name a few. The altars represent the lineage of guardian spirits and teachers of the profession. Although an image of the Buddha is often found on the altar, the Buddha is considered secondary to the ancestor teachers and the Hindu god Vishnu, to whom the altars are dedicated. The ceremony performed at the altar is a Hindu puja ceremony. I also learned that quite a few Cambodian Americans, mainly business people, former military or former police officers, as well as mediums, have such altars in their homes ranging in size from a small shelf on the wall to very large altars composed of three to nine levels. And often these, the larger uh, altars have their own room that's dedicated to them. These altars focus, store, and transmit important spiritual and practical knowledge that represent a significant aspect of Cambodian spiritual and everyday life. Despite the apparent widespread existence of these altars, this Hindu aspect of the Cambodian spiritual practice um, was not mentioned in any of the Buddhist uh, uh, works on Buddhism that I was reading. I was able to find only two sources which mentioned them. One on Cambodian medicine, because healers, the crew, the doctors will have um, these altars and one on Cambodian court dance. The scholarship on Cambodian Buddhism seemed primarily concerned with describing how Cambodian Buddhism adhered to or diverged from Orthodox Buddhism and was focused mostly on practices associated with monks and within the temple grounds. And this was puzzling to me. Uh, I, I believe one reason for the lack of information is that altars are not as accessible as the Buddhist monks and temples. Unlike Buddhism, there is no formal teaching, no ordained clergy, and no communal place of worship. Rather than seeing these people who have these altars as ritual experts in their own right and who represent an important ritual knowledge, the practice has been deemed part of popular religion, a label which appears to make it less important and seemingly not of particular interest to scholars. To be fair, the so-called popular religions of mainland Southeast Asia are highly complex and diverse, as the foregoing description of the altars suggests. Understanding them is not as easy as measuring how closely Buddhist practice follows doctrine. But this dichotomy between popular and um, orthodox religion is not at all helping, helpful in describing, let alone understanding, how world religions are interpreted and modified through local practices. So questions that arise from this are, what are the processes of synthesis? What is happening in the overlap between the popular and the orthodox? How is it happening? What does it mean to the people who believe and act in between those margins? Who are the actors who insist on perpetrating the separation of popular and orthodox religions? 
And finally, how can we as scholars reconceptualize the category of religion so we can better understand the holistic and embodied nature of these spiritual practices? Thankfully, recent scholarship is attempting to fill the gap. The most recent being an outstanding edited volume on spirit possession in Buddhist Southeast Asia, edited by Barak Dilad Perrier and Peter Jackson. It is also the concern of today's panelists. And so I will now introduce them. Our first panelist is Dr. Tatsuki Kataoka. Dr. Kataoka is a professor in the Graduate School of Asian and African Studies at Kyoto University in Japan. He has a PhD in area studies and a master's in social and cultural studies from Kyushu University, Japan. His field work among hill tribes and Chinese immigrants in Thailand has focused on cultural, uh, I'm sorry, on culture and religion. Currently, he is also studying folk religions of Japan in, to aid in the inter-regional comparison of religious practices at the margin of state regulation. Dr. Kataoka will be speaking on deities outside religion, state regulation of religion, and secular shrines in Thailand. His talk will focus on how the Western concept of religion has been imposed by the state on local practices, resulting in official designation of what religion is constitute, what religion constitutes. So which practices do and which do not qualify as religion. Our second panelist is Dr. Yasuko Yoshimoto. Dr. Yoshimoto is a specially appointed research fellow and part-time lecturer at the Graduate School of Asian and African Area Studies at Kyoto University in Japan. She has her master's and PhD from the Graduate School of Cultural Studies and Human Science at Kobe University in Japan. She conducts research on ethnicity and religion among the Cham in Vietnam. The title of Dr. Yoshimoto's talk is Islamic Religious Practices in Vernacular Religion Among the Chambani of the Hoi Zhao in Vietnam. Hoi Zhao, which is Vietnamese for Islam, is a state recognized religion in Vietnam. The Chambani is one of two groups identified by the state as Hoi Zhao. Dr. Yoshimoto's presentation will focus on the interrelationship between Orthodox Islam, the Hoi Sao, and Chambani practice and identity. Our third panelist, Dr. Punachi Giaviri Yabunya, is a Thai Chinese anthropologist from the Isan region in Northeastern Thailand. Dr. Giaviri Yabunya is a lecturer in cultural anthropology and tourism at Nakhon Phnom University, Thailand. She has her PhD in anthropology from the Australian National University in Canberra, Australia, and her master's in cultural anthropology from Northern Illinois University. She has conducted research on spiritual healing, among Thai Khmer in the Sarin and Sri Saket provinces of Thailand, and specifically on divinatory authority among urban Khmer in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, which will be the top, her topic today. Her dissertation offers an alternative body of knowledge and approach, drawing upon the post Khmer Rouge's revival movement of astrological and divinatory practice that had been marginalized by the Khmer scholars, Khmer studies scholars. Dr. Giaviri Yapunya will speak on improvisation of divinity and authority in Cambodia. Let's see. So I will turn this over to Dr. Kata Open. Thank you.
Okay, I am to uh, I'm to uh, to talk, right? Yes. Okay, okay. Thank you for invitation and uh, good afternoon to everyone in Hawaii. And and um, uh, good morning uh, to to those in Asia. And my today's my talk uh, partly uh, already appeared in in, uh, in a journal of Kyoto University. And uh, yeah, I think that uh, chat box is used only to to panelists, and and that's why I I show uh, the web page here for uh, for reference. My case study of Phuket uh, already appeared in the uh, Kyoto University's uh, journal, uh, Southeast Asian Studies, Volume 1 and Number 3, uh, Special Issue, the Institutionalizing Religion in Southeast Asia. And here is my, uh, my part, and, uh, and you will easily find it uh, at the website of uh, Kyoto University Center for Southeast Asian Studies and uh, look for by looking for volume one, number three. And fortunately, uh, Yasuko Yoshimoto's article is also here. And, and if you have time, I, I, um, I, I hope you will find for further inquiry. And, um, and anyway, uh, going back to, uh, to my, today's my, uh, my talk, Uh, <laughs> simply uh, talking uh, about San Chao or Chinese temples in Phuket uh, will be a simple repetition of uh, past article and that's why I extended uh, some uh, some case studies from other parts of Thailand uh, or, or, or nationwide issues. And the topic will be uh, concentrated on the on the mutual relations of uh, of uh, uh, officially institutionalized religion and non uh, and religious activities outside it, and uh, state regulations uh, concerning these uh, officially sanctioned religions and, and and other religious facilities. And in this uh, talk, I will use a Chinese temple. For uh, for English uh, counterpart of the Thai term San Chao, and um, and Chinese term actually uh, in Thailand there are some officially recognized Buddhist monasteries, uh, Chinese uh, Buddhist monasteries, and, and these are also and these can also be called Chinese temples. But uh, today I omit uh, this. Uh, Officially, Chin Nikai or Annam Nikai uh, Chinese temples, and and simply uh, my topic will concent uh, be concentrated on San Chao, and, and that is in Chinese shrine. It, it may be uh, in translated to Chinese shrines rather than uh, Chinese temples as well. But anyway, uh, go ahead to to the case study of San Chao. And, <clears throat> When we talk about uh, the institutionalization of uh, of Thailand under modern state power, uh, um, I, I think I should talk uh, from 1902 when uh, the first Sangha Act was promulgated, and this uh, this legislation aims at uh, creating a nationwide hierarchy of uh, institutionalized uh, Buddhism for the first time in, in the history of Siam, Siam and Thailand and place it under uh, state control. And alongside, along uh, with it, uh, or oh, for, for Asian peoples, uh, including Japanese, Institutionalizing religion in uh, under modern state uh, under modern state always comes along with the, the problem of translation of the term religion. In Thailand, uh, the term sasana was uh, selected to its counterpart, but however, 
sasana before and uh, modernization sasana and both sasana uh, usually uh, had denoted uh, simply buddhism but however after opening the state to western power and after uh, especially after the uh, 1932 constitution the sasana uh, the sasana's meaning uh, and has become clo closer to the western modern western concept of religion in general so so there are some religion some sasana uh, other than buddhism sasana islam sasana kri or, or, or something else and and uh, theoretically these sasanas uh, are expected to to stand in equal terms uh, although or the Buddhist, Buddhist, uh, Buddhism uh, enjoys uh, a special uh, favor of, of the Thai state. And anyway, in 1940, it is 1941, when uh, the special uh, the, the government agency uh, assigned to, to take care of religious issues uh, from Kansasana was established. And by and the translation of uh, the term religion in Asia always uh, always uh, comes along with uh, its byproduct. If if sasana is selected to be a uh, counterpart of religion, there appear there. there there will uh, be uh, many religious activities or deities which or, or facilities which do not meet Western standard of religion or Western definition of religion. And in, in Thailand, translation of religion products, the, uh, the domain of Lati. And in uh, this is not special to Thailand. In in Japan, we have Shukyo. Uh, in 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 Chinese, Tongjiao, uh, Vietnamese, Tongzao, Korean, Jongyo, and in Malay, Indonesian, Agama. Everywhere, yeah, translation of religion producted such a kind of a secondary status religion outside the state. Uh, uh, officially sanctioned domain of religion, and in Thailand it is lucky It stands for such uh, ritual niche uh, of uh, non-recognized religions. And San Chao or Chinese temples are also categorized as a facility of lati, not religion, and it is quite natural that uh, that its jurisdiction is placed under the Ministry of Interior, not of the Department of Religious Affairs. So San Chao activities or Chinese temple activities are theoretically not religion. And uh, this is reflected in uh, government census. And here is a list of list of populations and religious place, uh, number of religious places of officially recognized religions. Uh, here are Buddhism, Islam, Christianity, Brahman, Hinduism, Sikh, and others. But there are no, there's no room for Chinese temples other than uh, Chinikai or Chinese sect of Mahayana school with very few numbers of, of, of monasteries. The vast majority is uh, the vast majority of Chinese uh, temples or San Chaos are outside of uh, uh, this census, totally uh, dropping from uh, the government and the state's administration of religion. And what uh, happens uh, if Chinese temples are to almost totally uh, left outside of uh, religion? by state definition and we look uh, very briefly uh, the situation of Phuket where, and, uh, where the Chinese immigrant population is very concentrated in the city and very much Chinese town and here is a, 
is a number of population and religious places in Phuket. Then, uh, uh, of course, Buddhist, Buddhists are in the dominant population with uh, um, uh, 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 with Islam in in the south, southern part of Thailand. Islam <coughs> is considerably. Um, Islam's population is also considerable. And religious, 31 uh, Buddhist uh, religious places do not include uh, Chinese temples. And what happens in Phuket is that very few number of uh, what, what uh, monasteries and, and monks as compared to national average, one, one what with uh, over seven thousand uh, population in Phuket, while uh, one one what uh, per uh, two thousand in uh, national average, and one monk takes care of one th of one thousand uh, five hundred. Uh, people in Phuket while uh, in national average, uh, one monk per uh, over 30, uh, uh, no, 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 300 uh, people. It means that uh, Phuket people, it, it, we can uh, stimulate that uh, Phuket people, Phuket Buddhist people uh, must be reliant on something else, something other than officially recognized what a monk in, in their religious activities. Indeed, in Phuket, Phuket's population accounts for 0.4% uh, of national uh, total, but Buddhist temples accounts for only 0.001% uh, of, of, uh, of national total, while Chinese temples Recognize, officially recognized Chinese temple by the Ministry of Interior occupies 3.5% out of uh, national total. And this means that uh, Chinese temple's presence is, uh, is, uh, is larger than uh, other parts of Thailand. Uh, and in other words, Phuket Buddhist, uh, Phuket Buddhism is in, in many aspects uh, reliant on the existence of uh, Chinese temples, which are not recognized as religious, uh, religious facilities uh, in, in national jurisdiction. And it is uh, curious enough to find many uh, Buddhist saints in such uh, San Chao or Chinese temples. This is uh, Luan Po Chen, uh, Theravada uh, Buddhist uh, monk is all uh, is even worshipped in Chinese uh, temples in Phuket. And, and this is Chao uh, Me Quan Im. And this is a Chinese uh, Chinese Mahayana Buddhist monk and, and Cho Su Kong is also uh, uh, such a uh, figure, Chin uh, Chinese Mahayana monk in, in, in former days in, in mainland China. And this Cho Su Kong is uh, particularly uh, popular among the, the Hokkien's. And the fact that uh, Oh, now oh, oh, already <laughs> time is already running out, and oh, okay, okay, I, I will very uh, okay. I, I will skip some uh, slides. That uh, Chinese temples are left from the national uh, state uh, administration of religion means that Chinese such Chinese temples enjoy a considerable degree of freedom in their pantheons. Uh, Composition. Mm. Here are uh, Shiva uh, worshipped as Bun Tao Kong, and this is Thai soldier, and, and this is um, mixed with uh, King Man Rai worship, and this is uh, some, uh, local local Thai 
as worship of uh, Zhao Po in, in Mejian Shen, right? And even Islamic uh, guardian uh, spirit of locality is, is placed in Chinese temples. But uh, since Chinese temples are non-religious uh, places, we are not, uh, they are not expected to answer to the question what religion it belongs to. And, and this is what I, I mean by the term considerable uh, freedom of, uh, of Pantheon. However, there are always, uh, I don't mean that, that this is totally uh, apart from institutionalization of religion. This, indeed, there do exist a channel to connect uh, institutionalized state sanction and officially recognized Buddhist monasteries and Chinese temples are something outside it. And since Chinese temples are, most of the Chinese temples have no ordained religious specialist. They always uh, reliant on Chinese, uh, Chinese or, or Thai Buddhist monks to, to preside over uh, annual ceremonies. It means mm -hmm. that Chinese temples take part of a lay position in a, in a larger system of Buddhism. So uh, they are lay, uh, no, no custom, lay, uh, what uh, I say, uh, in, in, uh, as this picture uh, shows, they are lay client of uh, Chinese uh, official Buddhism. Uh, and, and this is a, a figure to show uh, uh, the wider system of Buddhism uh, with the Theravada, uh, Theravada as monasteries at the top, and below that, and there are many uh, shrines at uh, non-recognized temples as lay client of uh, of, of state Buddhism. This is my uh, findings from the field of Thailand. Thank you. Can I, can I stop sharing? Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Thank you. I have, I have a lot of questions from that too. It's quite exciting to see the overlap and um, integration of uh, religious practices going on there and religious experts that are involved. So very good. Thank you. Um, okay, so our next uh, panelist is Dr. Yoshimoto, Islamic Religious Practices and Vernacular Religion among the Chambani of How is Thou in Vietnam. Uh, are you sharing my slide? Yes. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you for invitation. My name is uh, Yasuko Yoshimoto. And... Uh, my title is Islamic Religious Practices in Vernacular Religion through the case of Chambani of Hoi Zhao in Vietnam. And uh, my presentation will uh, just introduce the case uh, of Chambani, mostly based on the, the, my article uh, published 10 years ago uh, that uh, Kataoka-san just uh, uh, introduced. Um, and I'm sorry for that. Uh, some data are not updated. Uh, at, at first, I'd like to describe that uh, what is Hoi Zhao? 
Since the 1990s, the Vietnamese government has uh, strengthened the legislation on religious policy. And in 2004, the ordinance for religion and belief was promulgated. And in 2016, the country's first law on uh, religion and belief, uh, which was uh, created based on the ordinance, was passed by the Diet. In this process, people's belief and act in the country are conceptually uh, clearly divided into two categories, religion and belief. And Hoi Zhao is one of 16 state-recognized religion in Vietnam, trans translated as Islam. It is divided into two sects, one is Sunni, is also called Islam or New Islam in the country, and the other is called Bani or Old Islam. Both followers are mostly the Cham, who are uh, believed to be descendant of Champa. So the followers usually called Cham Islam or Cham Bani. There are considerable difference between the two groups in terms of religious practices, why the uh, Cham Islam uh, as aspire to orthodox Islam as Sunni Muslim, the Chambani are strongly influenced by local and traditional customs and beliefs and have uh, incorporated with elements Brahmanism and ancestor worship. For that matter, uh, Chambani people, they usually say uh, that they are uh, followers of Hizau, but not Islam. More specifically, they uh, identify themselves as followers of Hoiza or Bani, but not as Muslim. This uh, lies the question uh, whether Hoiza can just translate it as Islam. Okay. And next, I'd like to give a brief overview of Cham Bani within the Cham ethnic group. The total population of Cham in Vietnam today is approximately 130,000. And the Cham are roughly divided into at least the four groups on the basis of their religious identity. In addition to Cham Bani and Cham Islam in Hoi Zhao, there are also followers of, of Brahmanism, uh, Cham Balamon, and the Aminist, the Cham Hroi. <clears throat> As mentioned earlier, uh, the Chambani don't share the self-recognition as Muslim. And in reality, the people have tendency to share the same and more uh, definite identity with the Chambalamon. The two religious groups of people have both lived in Nintum and Bintum provinces, the homeland of Champa's uh, Panduranga dynasty. And indeed, they share many cultural elements, such as a manuscript written in Cham script, traditional calendar, and understanding of history based on these materials. And they even believe in same gods and spirits. The two societies in the region, both based on mater materialist descent, uh, descent system and structurally, they are made up of uh, two categories, uh, religious priest and laity. Then I would like to introduce some of religious practices of Jambani. First, uh, ritual rituals. Ritual rituals are the common practices with Chambalamo, but there are various types and sizes of these rituals. But in many cases, ancestral spirits, uh, achet atau, uh, enshrined dated of matrilineal lineage in a basket, are served uh, and led by the re re religious priest called Mutuan. Uh, Mutuan chants, uh, during the rituals, Mutuan chants and uh, beat the drum. Uh, the photo shows. The photo on the left shows small rija to pray for recovery from illness of, of the woman. 
in the center. This photo shows, uh, sorry. And these photos show uh, prayers to the kings of Champa. People visit and pray to these gods or saints according to their wishes. Like the photo on the left, uh, uh, women who want to pray for pregnancy or and smooth delivery often visit and pray to goddess such as Ponaga or the village people who want to pray for the God, good harvest occasionally organize the service to village guardian deities. These acts are also the same with Chambalamon. Let's say uh, there's uh, practical differences between the Chambani and Chambalamon. Um, then I introduce some religious practices particular to Chambani. In the Chambani society, religious priests called Achal uh, carry out Islamic religious practices on behalf of the laity, such as uh, recitation of the Quranic phrases, but uh, they do not follow uh, Muslim duty strictly, not even the uh, requisite uh, prayers five times a day. In fact, they are not uh, considered by the people as simply priests, but also as rep representative of each descendant group because of the important role they play, particularly in funeral rituals, and ancestor worship. Therefore, the motivation to become an achal is usually explained it by the uh, by desire to serve the descendant group. One of their main role is uh, reciting uh, Arabic phrases during these rituals for the dead. For Chambani, Ramadan, uh, which they call uh, Ramuan, is the most important season in their religious life. It is a secret uh, month because it is the time when ancestors return home and the Achal stay at the, tam the Tamuki, the, uh, this uh, mosque, Bani's mosque. Uh, for one month and adhere to a uh, vegetarian diet. Although Lam Lamuang has been described as a, a distorted version of Muslim uh, fasting months, the people do not actually fast. Three days before the first day of the month, la month of Lam 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 Ramadan, Lamuang, People visit the graveyard of their matrilineal lineage and invite their ancestral spirits back to their house, houses. After the three days graveyard visit, people make offerings to the ancestral spirits uh, residing in their homes. First, they uh, prepare the meal offering to uh, every ancestral spirit, then they make individual offerings to descendant members. The table shows the uh, some uh, process of Ramadan uh, during the Ramadan, the prayers uh, during the Ramadan of uh, uh, adults. In the month of Ramadan, um, many uh, rites, uh, rituals are similar to the memorial service who uh, have passed away. These offerings are made by male members who uh, recite the Quran and who usually achal, 
However, the oldest woman of the household usually has the responsibility of remembering the name of dedicated over the uh, span of the uh, aprodix uh, immediately, seven generations. Sorry. And uh, the first table, sorry, I. Uh, this one, I, I just talked about, about this one, sorry. And the first day of Ramadan, after sunset, the Achal entered the Tamki. This marks the beginning of the holy month of Ramadan. During this month, they stay in the Tamki, away from their families, to serve Allah five times a day. However, uh, the table six shows the name and time of players are different from Muslim players. Lay women uh, and elderly men, all dressed in white, uh, watch and pra uh, participate in these prayers, but they do not recite the Quran. The main function of the female is to bring set of uh, betel nuts for the ancestral spirits to pray for the uh, blessing. <clears throat> As uh, both, the chambani is a unique category. Since the uh, French period, it uh, has been written like uh, unorthodox Muslim or uh, strange Muslim. And today, in the sense that the people are officially categorized as Vietnamese Muslim, uh, however, they do not identify themselves as Muslim. Some of the Chambani villages and intellectuals who I uh, appro approached claim that it is a mistake to view them as Muslims. According to them, Chambani is one branch of Cham religion or Agama, Agama Cham rather than uh, rather of Islam. And the Agama Cham have been religious sect of, uh, have two religious sect, Awal and Ahir. In uh, colloquial language, Awal is called Bani. Awal as symbolizing women and Ahir as symbolizing men and uh, uh, Balamon. These two are diametrically opposed to each other in a sense, yet also cannot exist uh, one without the other. So uh, people of uh, Chambani adopted Islamic uh, elements or culture, but they didn't ac accept them passively or, or mechanically. Instead, by creatively and selectively adopting them, they assimilated to a new religion into their own economic and cultural pra practices. Uh, this is uh, why even today they do not worship only Allah, but also the God. After the 2000, the, some of the group of Chambani who uh, conv uh, converted to Islam. However, most of the Chambani still remain as Chambani. And uh, in Vietnam, now uh, come back to the uh, what did Hoi Zhao, the the question what is Hoi Zhao. Um, in Vietnam, the state uh, didn't separate these popular or orthodox elements of uh, Hoi Zhao, Islam. And so Hoi Zhao it, uh, in Vietnam, regardless of culture, used in uh, the uh, the Islam in Vietnam, uh, 
sorry, horizontal in Vietnam uh, is actually the polythetic. Polythetic. So uh, I'm wondering, um, you can say that uh, just translated to Islam. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yoshimoto. Very interesting. Our next panelist is uh, Dr. Villavera Yabunya. I'm not even sure I'm saying your name correctly. Villavera <laughs> Yabunya. But it's yeah, a yeah, 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 Authority in Phnom Penh after the Khmer Rouge. So, um, again, good morning from Thai Tom. And um, I think it's this topic, I mean, this panel is so fascinating and, and so enjoying to, from the previous talks. So, but from my talk is part of my thesis. Title Khmer Ways of Seeing Migration and Divinatory Improvisation in Phnom Penh. So it is based on my thesis. And I hope that if you have time, you just download and read the whole thesis. What I'm going to present to you today is just only one chapter, chapter five, and you can download it later. Um, today in my talk, I will explore how astrology and divination have been reinvented and improvised by urban migrants in Cambodia, in Phnom Penh. The ethnographic data highlight the life narrative of the head Cambodian astro the head of Cambodian royal astrologer, or you can say an elite astrologer who came from the countryside to improvise his divinatory authority in the city. Reflecting on his reputation, trying to reinvent astrology knowledge in Cambodia. In this talk, I expand from the main theme of my thesis, which is to understand the reinvention of the Khmer cultural traditions from the lands of migrant workers in Phnom Penh. In this talk, I, I ask, how could a migrant villagers become such an influential and recognized national authority on divination? Secondly, does his divinatory technique represent the traditional Khmer divinatory system or has he reinvented the astrological tradition? The anal analytical focus of this, of this talk is to contextualize the individual astro the individual improvisation and the social mobility of this elite astrologer as one of several attempts to establish divinatory authority in the contemporary Cambodia. The ethnographic account shows that the elite astrologer has improvised his divinatory authority through resources and knowledge assembled in the context of cultural discontinuity and, and rupture with the tradition occurring since the Khmer Rouge era. Um, I have to say that, and this is, um, I plan to make the connection from my talk and to what Sue have asked, has asked early about you know these kinds of discussion, I will save it for later. 
I have to say that from the early stage in my field work, I learned that many Khmer people in Phnom Penh had a particular assumption about city and village and about urban versus rural for tune healers and the locations where the authentic forms of divinatory practice are believed and to have been preserved. So they have their dimension about, you know, urban and rural tradition of astrology. As many people immediately comment, it was wrong, totally wrong, Poon, to conduct the research about astrology in Phnom Penh. You should not come here. You should go to the rural, especially to Siem Reap, because Siem Reap is more real, more pure, authentic form of cultural tra traditions. Phnom Penh is not the right place to conduct these kinds of topics. And according to local assumptions, real and authentic astrology and divination are the center. And true divinatory authority can be found only in village, in the countryside, or in the province where Khmer traditions and heritage have been preserved. And this is could contribute to what Sue has asked before. <laughs> As such, however, after spending 14 months in Phnom Penh, I realized that practice of divination, magic, and spiritual cults in Phnom Penh are diverse and complex. Spanning, uh, spanning market uh, from the marketplace and Buddhist temples, and in, including both the wealthy and poor among the devotees, I mean, from the rich and the poor, and everywhere you can see practice of divination and magic are like very complex and diverse in Phnom Penh. And this is kind of the complexity and hybridity that I, I mentioned you because um, after I spent a lot of time hanging out with um, even like uh, young migrant workers, whose uh, some of them are like university students. I follow to their house and I observe that, oh, they also practice hybrid form of religious belief and rituals. For example, you can see from the second picture that Mahayana, our Chinese religious tribe, along with um, the belief in ang ang ancestors and also with the Buddha and also and misbelief and this is kind of like what we has what we have discussed about you know a form of religious syncretism and it has been taking taking place in Phnom Penh after the Khmer Rouge even more complex why many educated Cambodians embody cosmopolitan life lifestyle they nonetheless try to make sense of their life through a range of uh, local religious technologies and ritual practice, which they believe can help secure their fortune and prevent bad luck from uncontrollable or in invisible force. And even you can see that with the monks who are representative for Buddhism, some of them still have you know, the expertise in reading palm, reading fortune, or even making a, fet a fetish objects like yantra, and also deliver service to people in Phnom Penh. But what I, what I am to highlight today is not, is not the author technique, it's not the, the big picture because I don't have much time. And I just want to give you some idea that this is some of the divinatory techniques in Phnom Penh that, that I observed that they have that can be read from you know the old the old scriptures in uh, the pagoda or temples or and also with the card readings from the street on the street everywhere even to the market like uh, Tutumpong like Pasatma you can see this card reading is everywhere. 
and also the monks practice divination, as I mentioned. And of course, with the medium mystic for Jun Hele, it's, it's very um, strong and um, gain a lot of followers from the Khmer uh, customers. And of course, numerology. And of course, again, online divination through the, app, the applications. But what I'm going to highlight today is um, about the life experience of a migrant who migrated from Kapong Cham to the city. I would say that Khmer urban people, especially migrants, uh, still attempt to repurpose their cultural traditions involving divination, magical technologies, and spiritual beliefs to the best of their abilities in the context of uncertainty, uncertain circumstance, and familiar relations with the ambivalent knowledge of traditions to overcome vulnerability or marginality and maintain security and power. And this is the guy that I'm going to present today is um, the, he is the head of Royal Astrologer serving for the king at the palace. I first heard about him, his name is Emborin, when I started developing my research proposal in 2014. His name appeared in many reports on divination in local news, newspaper. The Khmer reporters introduced his official position as head of the National Committee of Khmer Customs and Horoscopes of the Ministry of Cults and Religion. And one reporter described his official job as a researcher studying the Khmer astrology. Also, the local media call him as a traditional fortune teller or a royal astro astrologer and also the almanac writer. He also a very um, famous writer for his uh, astrological guidebook. Emborin is thus understood locally to be representative of the government and official assign the role of the state astrologer. His astro astrological handbooks are often the only reference source for urban Khmer people interest in learning about astrology. He is the only one in Phnom Penh who wrote the astrology astrological guidebook and for selling, very popular. And Emborin tried to distinguish himself from the ordinary fortune tellers in the marketplace by referring, by referring to his so sophisticated knowledge in divination practice. He differentiated himself from Grudie which is in Khmer, Kru Diye, Kru is Kru, right? Or teacher in general meaning of Thai linguistic term. Kru Diye, Diye or guessing. Diye means guess. It means that Kru Diye means that a master or a teacher who can read the fortune. Or Kru Diye is a fortune teller, but in general sense is a, a street level. Uh, but he tried to distinguish himself from a street level of the fortune teller. Because of the Grutier, just read the fortune without any background knowledge, without reference to an astrological handbook. For example, medium mystic fortune tellers and market based for fortune tellers merely guess at people fortune, risking the possibility of a wrong prediction prediction. Meanwhile, Emborin insists that his fortune telling or divination skill was more reliable and trustworthy compared to the ordinary one. He also distinguished himself from a jar or a master. And some of you have mentioned about this term, a jar exactly like a jar in Thai. But Aja in ritual, in Khmer ritual context, mean 
religious master or religious practitioners who usually conduct rituals ceremonies at the pagoda. Sometimes these ritual masters conduct religious ceremonies and ritual without paying adequate claim with uh, without paying ad adequate attention to auspicious timing because they were in a rush to service the other clients, but it's not him. He claimed that he always spent a long time to calculate the auspicious time to conduct religious ceremonies. This is the example why he is so different from the others. I'm gonna skip. Um, I would say that um, I, re I really want to share today is he is from Kampong Cham province. He is a migrant, but he's become the elite astrologer because of the connection and support from the CPP party, the political party in Phnom Penh. And um, right now you can call him as Ek Udom or his Ek Excellency due to his reputation and skill in applying so physical divinatory techniques. Uh, I really want to share, but I probably run out of time. How many times that I have left, Sue? I, I don't know. I think that... Okay, I will run for um continue. Um, the life experience of the eight, the 58, <coughs> right now he's um turned to 63 now. Um, the life experience of Emberin remind me of the experience of the up the upward mobility of author command domestic migrant I had met randomly in the city. Emberin was born and raised in village in Kampung Cham. People in his village call call him uh, call his father in Chinese as Tao Ke. His father also a for for June Taylor, but using in different techniques. Um, late, late in the Khmer Rouge period, in 1978, Emberin started learning traditional Khmer astro astrology or Kapuan Mahasongkran. Kapuan Mahasongkran, as he claimed, is a traditional form of Khmer astrology. And this is, can be interchangeably used as a Thai astrological system as well. I probably mention later if I have time, but you have um, what his claim that he is the, uh, he kind of like the deliverer and the gatekeeper, as Sue mentioned, he is a gatekeeper to preserve Khmer traditional form of astrological practice and, mm -hmm. and divinatory practice. And he is the only one who is, the author, the writer of the astro astrological handbook, and he sell it, and he can make a lot of profit of his handbooks. And he, what if you ask me, what is his uh, specialized technique? He he knows a lot. He uh, expert in numerology, reading your your fortune from the cal the calculation number from your date of birth, asking you about when you were born and where you were born and he calculate to in make the connection to the auspicious time of your birthday. So this is a numerology. And he also used his sixth sense. He did not reveal that even though he, he carried the uh, rational form of the astro astrological system or techniques, but he not he did not refuse that he used the spiritual power spiritual connection because he also has the you know kind of like a, a sixth sense vinyan ti pramoy or sixth sense to to read the fortune and he also point out that the um the key historical transition of his life is the kamarus after the kamarus that he has to, I mean, he has nothing. He start from zero. He moved to Phnom Penh and he start learning astrology by himself. And one aspect I have to mention that he can read Thai so well, but he cannot speak Thai. This is weird, right? But he he can he can read Thai. So uh, that's why after the Khmer Rouge, 
um, he cannot access any Khmer astro astrological handbooks in the countries. What he asked, he asked his friend from Thailand to buy and send the Thai astro astrological textbook and send back to him. And one of the textbook that he borrowed from, I mean, I probably used to try to use the appropriate words, borrow. He tried to borrow some of Thai astro astrological knowledge by reading the Thai version of uh, the, the guidebook. And that's why he start to reinvent another version for mm -hmm. Khmer people mm -hmm. after the Khmer Rouge. And one of the book that he mentioned to me is uh, Tamra Promachat or Tamra Promachat in Khmer. is the story of this, uh, of this uh, guideline of this Thai textbook is related to uh, the sutra and related to um, um, uh, the belief of, of Brahman religion and related to, you know, Brahman form of rituals. And then he developed his own knowledge. And, uh, but he point out that the Khmer Rouge is a key, tran key transition that force he has to, you know, leave his hometown to the city. I think, I think that much it. Right, and this is my, probably my last slide here. You probably see that the guidelines or the astrological handbook that he wrote, but the left picture is Tam, Tam, Tamra Promachiat is in Khmer version, but it has the indication, explanation saying in Khmer that this version has been translated from Thai, Tamra <laughs> Pomacha. And this is, so you have to interest in this book because it has been translated before the Khmer Rouge, even before the Khmer Rouge and has been preserved um, from, you know, the rupture of tradition from the, you know, Khmer Rouge invention. What we heard and learned from the previous scholars that, oh, Khmer Rouge, destroy Buddhism, they force the monks to ordain. That's a lot of discourse. It's, I would say this is the mainstream discourse, but we have known nothing about how divination and mm -hmm. astrology have been preserved during the Khmer Rouge. I found that from, you know, from this guideline, from the Tamra Pomachat, from this axis of the evidence, I suggest that they have some indicator showing me that um, Khmer astrologers, Khmer fortune tellers, they try to improvise their own divinatory authority by using knowledge outside of the countries. And for example, Thai divination, for example, Burmese div divination, and especially for Emberin, he also employ Western knowledge of divination and also Chinese. You probably see um, the second and the third picture is uh, the cover of his textbook, of his handbooks. And you can see the elements of Mahayana and Chinese belief, and mm -hmm. even showing the Chinese script <coughs> on the cover. And probably mm -hmm. I would finish my talk right now. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Boon. That was wonderful. I was going to ask about the Chinese connection. You touched on it right at the very end. Right. So um, it doesn't look like we have any questions. Is that correct? No questions. Not yet. Okay, we'll give people a chance to formulate questions. And um, maybe we could go ahead with one of the things, they were all fascinating, wonderful, and really great examples of this synthesis that's going on, um, not just in the world religions, but the local 
religions as well, things that are that have changed um, historically, um, the cultures have been impacted in ways that um, that have affected the regeneration of, in some cases of um, practices, uh, in other cases, um, not really fully understanding uh, how the local people have accepted the world religions and how they identify themselves. Um, and um, also, uh, um, Tatsuki, you seem to suggest that there was an advantage for the um, the uh, uh, Chinese temples uh, by not being um, regulated or seen as religious temples, but as secular. Um, so th this is all very interesting. I don't um, just. I don't have a specific question, but maybe if any of you would like to um, talk about what you got out of this or share what you think coming together to talk about these things, there's there's a lot going on. There's a lot to, to um, identify um, in both what's happening with the local popular religions, what's happening with the world religions, was happening in the margins there. Um, and Tasuki, I'm gonna come back to you again too, because in the article that um, the journal uh, that you showed, the special issue that you did, uh, you talked about deinstitutionalizing religion. And I wonder if you could explain that. I think I might have interpreted your meaning a little differently than what you intended. Um, I saw that as an opportunity to try to bridge the gap between popular and orthodox by deinstitutionalizing the idea of religion. In the West, we tend to think religion means you have clergy, ordained clergy, you have a written, um, uh, a written uh, heritage, you know, something that's in writing to be interpreted. Uh, and you have um, a uh, you have an edifice, you have a building of sorts, right? A place for worship. Um, and we do have one question that maybe um, Tatsuki, you could just say what you meant by the be institutionalizing. Okay, uh, my use of the term the institutionalization uh, retrospectively think, uh, think, uh, Mm, would be somehow misleading in terms that uh, my intention was not to deconstruct existing religion itself, okay. but, uh, but I mean, we propose to another approach to religion in academic terms uh, by, by looking at the margin of institu institutions. Oh, okay. That, 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 is, is my, that was my original meaning. Oh, okay. All right. Good, thank you. Okay, we have a question from Anna uh, Sakom and then from Eric Perpum. Yep. So, okay. Can I answer Eric now? Oh. Uh, uh, yeah, and then we can come back to Sawatana. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, Eric, I mean, thank you so much for spending your time to listening to this panel is my honor because you are one of the famous Thai scholars. Mm -hmm. But um, I like your question so much. It's, it's so important. I'm thinking to share this one too, but I have the ethnographic data, but I just don't, don't have time to discuss about this. But one of the um, example of the ceremony that Emberin or the head of Bro Royal astro astrologer, he served and assist for the king about you know help the king conduct the ritual in at the royal palace, exactly similar to Thai rituals. Um, it's about the um ploughing ceremony. Ploughing ceremony in Thai spelling is piti jarod pranangkan ragnakwan. Right, you I think. Uh, Sue and um, Professor here with me or the audience who listening us probably familiar with um, you know ploughing ceremony. 
basically is from based on the belief from Brahman religion. Mm -hmm. um, they will um, they will assign the government officials, but used before. I mean, back to the in the past, the king will be head of state, right? He in fact is he is a head of state in a Thai monarchy. We talk about like back to the um, monarchy system. Um, king, he is the head of state. It actually it used to be the king who uh, also uh, represent for the countries and who can divine in terms of, I mean, the divination. He is the one who uh, take list of divining and and this this uh plucking ceremony used to be head of state or head of the king who conduct this plucking ceremony what is the plucking ceremony for um because you know thailand and cambodia are the same that we are um um the productivity most of our productivity are based on the agricultural products and what we need to you know it Sometimes we, uh, because the season, the season changed and we, in order to solve the uncontrollable circumstance, um, the king has to take action. And what he needs to do is first, he has to consult with the astrologer. Second, uh, what the astro astrologer um, advise him is to do a kind of rituals that he kind of like make, uh, he needs to, uh make some guess from from um uh, for example that he used to he need to um make the offerings to um the sac the sacred ox or the oxen to okay if the oxen uh drink water means that that year um the country will have a lot of water or we can be we can have blood but if that year with the oxen uh, eat a lot of veggies, means that that year um, we will can we can make you know the agricultural product, especially for um, vegetables and and everything will grow up. And I mean, this is just um, a, how can I say a a kind of divinatory rituals that the king used to as the head of the state and the king used to be like take lead of this ceremony. But later on, um, Thai king and Khmer king or Cambodian king assigned the, uh, the state officials like Ministry of Agriculture to do this role on behalf of the king. But <laughs> back to your, to your question, Eric, I mean, I would say that uh, Plowing ceremony is the example which um, allowed the royal astrologer to advise to the king and, and make the prediction what the sacred ox eats and um, um, what, the, uh, what the king can give the um, prediction for the country, what will be in the country, what the country would um, produce and and what the country would um you know overcome the uncontrollable uncontrollable circumstance and the plucking ceremony in Khmer that they also call Pyati Jarot Priyanangkol, similar to Thai linguistic system, but Priti Jarot Priyanangkhan also talking about you know um how the king can um make the prediction for the country through a form of divination. And this allowed the service of the head of astrologer to assist the king. And this is still exists in both country, both in Thailand and in Cambodia. Thank you, mm -hmm. Eric. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question too, Eric. Okay, we're going to get the question from Suathana. I um, understand that the microphones have been open so she can ask. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. First of all, I would like to thank you, everybody, for giving such a good presentation and very interesting. 
it made me stay awake the entire time <laughs> 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 because it could get a bit tired. But anyway, uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, Thai panelists, if we're talking about the Khmer divinity, the astrology, right? So today, so today, bong. So today, so today, so today, bong too. Uh, you were talking about the uh, yeah, the astrology was being reproduced or translated from Thai. Grudie. Yeah, I'm, I'm, what I'm talking about the Grudie. Yeah, the, the book you're talking about the book the guy who uh, from okay. the Punjab had translated. Okay. But, uh, yeah. But my question is because. From the Cambodian side, we always heard that the Thai always want to come over to Cambodia to, you know, to praise and so on and so forth like that. And now uh, mm. one time was a, like a famous event that the former prime minister had come to Prahi here, uh, to <laughs> Cambodia Prahi here and do all the, you know, praying and so on and so forth like right. that. Mm -hmm. Because of the divinity or whatever the term mm. is, is that more pure than um mm. more accurate than than in thai so that's yep. why i'm puzzling about you know where is the original because the Khmer mm. people say oh it's from Khmer and the thai oh that's from thai you know and this is a i saw this a lot of it uh exploded in um right right on facebook as well so okay. I, you know those are the things that i'll say i'm i'm kind of what what do you curious. think okay yeah curious it's a good question Bong, and our concern for for listening. Mm -hmm. um, I really I wish that I could get uh, some question from Khmer audience or Khmer scholars. And thank you so much. You know, Bong, um, one of the first experience that um, um, for the first month that when you know when after I went to to Phnom Penh, mm -hmm. I mostly hang out with the university students in Phnom Penh, right? And I introduce myself as a look crew from Thailand, try to conduct the thesis focusing on on astrology, on divination in Phnom Penh. Um, they are not only suggest me that, oh, you should go to somewhere else, not in Phnom Penh, that this kinds of this course, I have mentioned in in my talk, right, Bong? But another yes, another discourse that I I observe and I learn from from my field work is um with the um with this group with the young Khmer groups that I hang out with. I ask I ask them that oh, do you, what do you think that because of my Thai friend? I mean I I probably can share with you about this story. I most of my friends. Most of my friends who are like mid middle class Thai, born and raised in Thailand, they reflect to me that oh, Poon, if you go to Cambodia, it's the right place where you can conduct these kinds of research. It's the origins. This this is the place that the right place that you probably go to the authentic form of Khmer magical practice and divination. From Thai side, they think that Khmer people are the original producer, original practitioners who are expert in this kinds of practice. But bong, but after I went to Phnom Penh, my uh, key informants who are like young generation of Khmer, they reflect on on me that no, pick off or no, bong, you are wrong. I thought that it should be Thai who are expert in this kinds of practice because we was from the Lacan from the Thai series that the main actress and actor they are like fight to each other by using the magic, and this is the element that you know Bong um with back to your question that remind me about this discourse happening. I mean, if you ask me. What the origin? Where is the origins? I mean, which country who are the original producer of these kinds of traditions? I probably I have no answer for this, but it's so interesting to observe and learn that there are so discourse going on even now that 
um, we are, I'm not going to touch about, you know, the sensitive issues. What I'm going to, to say so is about, you know, from Thai side and from Khmer side and from the other countries in ASEAN countries, try to um, dominate or try to make claim that, oh, we are original, we are authentic. Mm -hmm. But who, who knows, Bong, who knows exactly <laughs> who are the real ones, you know? It, it's, you cannot answer this question. I mean, until right now, after, I mean, I already finished my thesis, Bong, but mm -hmm. it's difficult to answer this question. You probably, you're laughing and you probably know about this element. And from Thai side, I mean, Thai dominant discourse, Thai try to push the authors to, I mean, try to mm -hmm. um, see the authors like in Korea in terms mm -hmm. of, oh, they are, you are expert in magic. But I would mm -hmm. say that this is the Thai dominant discourse to look down the authors, but not mm -hmm. all Thai, I have to say, not all Thai, mm -hmm. but from the Khmer mm -hmm. side, Khmer people also see the authors in other tra traditions too, right? Well, yeah. you have to say that, oh, yeah, yeah. it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's you, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's, it's just, and yeah, no, I, I think I, you know, I just want to compare it because what the Cambodian is from what I hear, right? You say Cambodian is the original and the one. Right, one right, one. exactly. And they, they, they claim that that's why jo Angela Jolie came to Cambodia, get her one <laughs> from the Cambodian monk. You know, there is, you know, I say on, at the street. Right. Tower, street of, you know, okay. We yeah, have thanks. come to an end. I'm so sorry because we've <laughs> you so gone much, over Mom. time. Thank but thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry we can't get to all of the questions. I don't know, Tatsuki, did you see that there was a question for you? Um, also from Eric White. Uh, and, and I'm I think we can save the chat and the questions. Is that correct? And then yeah, yeah I, I already answered to his question. Oh, you did? Okay, good. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, all of you for attending, for taking the time to put this together. I so appreciate it. And um, I feel like we just got started in this conversation and there's so much more to talk about and so much more work to do. Um, but uh, thank you so much, Dr. Tatsuki Kataoka. I so appreciate it. I'm so happy to have met you. Um, and hopefully we'll get to talk more. Same, Dr. Yasuko Yoshimoto. Thank you. I've just really have enjoyed getting to know you as well. And Poon, Dr. Poon, thank you again um, for your time and your energy. And um, I just, and to the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at uh, University of Hawaii in Manoa, thank you. Um, this has been a wonderful gathering and I've really enjoyed it. Um, and I hope that we can continue to, to have these conversations um, outside of this venue. Uh, so thank you all. Anything else, Miriam, I have to do? <laughs> Miriam says, thank you, everyone. What a delight. Thank you. I agree. Okay, we're all done. Thank you. Have a good day ahead of you. I'm going to have a good evening. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good night.